Hello, I'm Chip Pickering. I'm the CEO of Encompass. We represent the leading internet companies and the builders of the new networks and competitive networks of the broadband and, and 5G and, and the networks that will really give amazing applications for the future. And so we're here today with a great panel. I'm very excited to talk about Section 230, which came out of the 1996 Act. Uh, when I was a young staffer, uh, we, we worked on a, a number of the different provisions of this act, but section 230, most people may not realize really uh, gave rise to the internet economy and the innovation and the investment and what we know now um, as is taken for granted in the internet companies, the social platforms, the applications for all businesses, small to large, and how section 230 has really promoted that, protected that, and has been a, a great American success story. So we wanna talk about where we are today with Section 230. It's uh, many times misunderstood. It is opposed uh, and, and criticized by many, right and left. And so what I, I hope is that the, the title of our panel today is from cooling, uh, excuse me, uh, from, from crisis. And, and then how do we go to, to cooling and consensus? And so that's uh, the, the objective of our, our panel today. I, I'd like to introduce a really great uh, group of, of people representing all the different uh, types of voices around the country. And today uh, we have Braden Cox, who is the head of public policy and social impact for Pinterest. My wife will be very happy that Pinterest is, is on this uh, panel but he is the head of U.S. Public Policy and Social Impact for Pinterest. He develops public policy strategy at the federal, state, and local level. Uh, earlier, uh, he worked at Amazon and has built uh, great teams working at, this, at the local, the state, and the federal level. And um, he's also a proud Georgia Bulldog. And as an Ole Miss SEC uh, grad, uh, Braden, it's great to have you with us, both undergrad and law school at Georgia. We also have Devon Jones, a Henry Gello Fellow uh, at the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council. He helped draft uh, the comments that, that um, his organization filed at uh, the NTIA uh, as it relates to Section 230. And we're very, uh, very pleased that we can have Devon with us. Then Ju Julie Samuels, the founder and executive director of Tech New York City. Uh, just a, an amazing background as well from engine, uh, engine advocacy of sm uh, startups and innovators uh, that, that are around the country. She was also at Electronic Frontier uh, Foundation and uh, worked with Mark Cuban on uh, how to stop, um, was it stupid? Uh, stupid patent. patents. <laughs> also an SEC grad. Oh, Don't leave where, me out. Where did you I go? I went to law school at Vandy. Uh, that is, um, well, this is an SEC day. And then well, we have our very own uh, uh, Lindsay Stearns, attorney and public uh, policy advisor at Encompass. And she came uh, to us from public knowledge. And so we're very pleased to, to have her. She's also worked with Senator uh, Durbin uh, and has uh, worked uh, really just tirelessly on Section 230 and other issues on behalf of Encompass and our members. And so I'd like to start with you, Lindsay. Tell us a little bit of where we are today with, with Section 230 and, and just give an overview of its history, its background and current status. Sure, thanks so much, Chip. So just to kind of give everyone a background of where we are today and where we've come from with Section 230. So. Section 230 has clearly received a lot of attention lately um, in the public, from Congress, the FCC, um, and in the executive branch. And last Congress alone, we saw over 20 bills introduced to change um, or repeal Section 230. And former President Trump even vetoed a major defense bill because it didn't include a Section 230 repeal. So it's, it's become really important. Um, and so last May, just to take everyone back, two days um, after Twitter flagged a post by um, former President Trump for misinformation, Trump issued an executive order called Preventing Online Censorship. And one thing that the executive order did, it was that it asked NTIA, which is housed in the Department of Commerce, to file a petition for rulemaking 
with the FCC um, asking the agency to clarify provisions that would limit um, the language and the use of Section 230's liability shield. So last summer, the FCC issued public comment on the petition and many groups, including Encompass, filed in opposition to the petition. Um, and one reason many of us cited was that if any reform were to occur with Section 230, it should happen in Congress. Um, and, but the last FT, FCC under Chairman Pai um, didn't end up moving forward with that petition. So that's a little bit um, where, we, where we're coming from. And today, um, just recently in the Senate nomination hearing for Gina Raimondo um, as a, the Secretary of Commerce, one Senator asked her in the hearing her thoughts on Section 230. And she actually responded, um, she believes in competition, but that this is an issue she'd leave to Congress um, and the FTC. Um, but she also said that she believes in Section 230 reform. Um, and if she were confirmed, she would use NTIA's resources to convene stakeholders to figure out the details of, of any reform um, if that were to occur. So I will say there's definitely appetite today in Congress to address Section 230. Um, and that could also potentially now include the help of NTIA. But that's where we're coming from. And we'll see where we're going. <laughs> And before I ask the next uh, question, I'm, I'm going to give a, a quote from Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of, of belief. It was an epic of incre incredulity. It was a season of light. And it was a season of darkness. But then this is the good. It was the spring of hope. And so in that last positive, as we look at Section 230, uh, Julie, uh, Braden, why is it so important? And, and as, as we look back and celebrate the 25th anniversary of Section 230 in the 1996 Act, what has it meant to our economy, uh, your companies, those that you represent? And just kind of uh, talk about why it's so important. I can go ahead and Brad and I'll hand it over to you to talk about Pinterest a little bit more specifically. But, you know, I think if you take a step back and think about Section 230 and what it means for how the internet actually functions. It's really, it's pretty interesting. You know, it's hard to remember, but before Section 230 in the early 90s, well, first of all, not as many people were online, but there was real debate about how the internet would work. Would the internet be like television or print journalism where you spoke one to many, where you, had to have resources to get your voice out, or would it be where you could speak many to many? And we decided as a society, Congress decided uh, that, that we were going to use this new medium, this new technology that existed that was so accessible to allow people to speak many to many, to lower the barrier to entry, to be able to have an audience. Um, and so we made that decision about the internet. And I think we kind of, we've got, in the debate, we've gotten away from reminding ourselves that. And, and I hope we don't lose sight of it because as, and we'll talk more about this as, as I think this conversation goes on, but that is like a fundamental thing in how we use the internet. And what that's meant for, for companies, not just for individuals who speak, is what that's meant is that all these companies have thrived. And it's not just these huge, huge companies, like you know the ones who get all the attention on these issues. We talk about Google, we talk about YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, like these companies that fundamentally rely on 230, but tons of small startups as well. And, and all the companies in between. If you have comments, a comment section on your website, you know, it, it, for many, depending uh, on some, proposals that literally just came out this morning as we record, um, how you treat advertisements, paid ads on your website. You know, this really encompasses tons and tons of different web content. So maybe we'll hash through some of that and we can talk about it. But I think that we need to remember what sets the internet apart as a medium from traditional broadcast, from traditional print, from traditional radio, and how as a society, we, we want to think about that. And Braden, uh, from your perspective. Yeah, um, you know, thanks, Julie and, and Chip. Um, you know, 
Section 230 is important to Pinterest because it provides the clear rules that we need for the content on Pinterest and for how we enforce our policies. Um, you know, I think every company will be different. Every, every company has a different business model, but for Pinterest, for us, it starts with our mission, which is we want to inspire people to live a life they love. And, you know, our mission guides how we build our products, our services, informs our perspective on content moderation and even Section 230. Um, you know, because we want a lot of people to come on Pinterest and to be on the site, um, you know, the, the people that we that actually come to the site, we call them pinners. Um, you know, we want them to find inspiring ideas and we put a lot of thought into the content we provide and the policies that we create. So, you know, you could say, I think, you know, we value Section 230 in a couple of ways, really. Um, the first is that it, it does allow us to help people find inspiring content on Pinterest. Uh, we curate positive content and we promote new features all the time. Um, one example of that is called compassionate search. So say you're feeling anxious or overwhelmed and you search on Pinterest using the phrase stress relief. You'll get a result that invites you to learn more about resources that can help and guided activities to redirect your energy. You know, this could be by journaling or drawing or making a greatest hits music playlist. Um, we've created an entire collection of these and we've worked very closely with emotional health experts to do this. Um, you know, the second way that I think Section 230 is important for us is, you know, we recognize that not all content is inspiring, of course. And so Section 230 enables us to enforce our policies and restrict and remove content in ways that our users expect and appreciate from Pinterest. Um, we take proactive and responsible steps to combat everything from health misinformation to harassment. And, um, you know, overall, Section 230 promotes our ability to make people feel welcomed on Pinterest, to create a place where they want to find inspiration. And ultimately, that's critical to our ability to fulfill our mission. Well, and Devon, um, a lot of times people, you know, they, they do view this debate to be about the big uh, companies that Julie mentioned just a little while ago, whether it's the, the Google, the Facebook, the Twitter. But talk about uh, your, um, your perspective of how Section 230 helps and protects those voices that might be marginalized. And we'd love to hear your, your view. Well, uh, I don't think, I think that my perspective is gonna be a bit less interesting than MMTC's. Um, and the, the organizations we work with. But speaking from that point, um, you know, there's a lot of opinions and a lot of different takes on it. But I think that the general, the general consensus is, it seems to be that, you know, much like Julie and, um, and Mr. Cox just discussed, that you know, Section 230 allows the uh, different organizations, including civil rights organizations, the space to say what they got to say. And it, engage, uh, it uh, does that by creating an environment uh, where platforms are not unduly restricted by absurd amounts of litigation to engage in content moderation practices that allow that kind of freedom and that kind of, uh, you know, safe and open-ended user experience. Um, for civil rights organizations that we worked with, um, so that goes to like the National Urban League, the National Hispanic Federation, uh, LULAC, um it, you know it's going to be important in that same sense um you know they're they're organizations just like other organizations and um you know the the constituents that they represent and that we work with um you know, that tend to be uh tend to be groups that are historically targeted for concepts like voter suppression uh and for disinformation campaigns and so having these spaces online where um, content moderation practices can be engaged in openly and, um, you know, without undue restriction, uh, allows these spaces to be places where those forces can be pushed against. Um, we, we talked in our, uh, we, we talked in our, um, in one of our briefings about how 2020 seemed to be a year of voter empowerment, uh, conversely to prior years of, uh, voter disenfranchisement. And, you know, the, I think that another thing that uh, is important here is that uh, hasty, uh, hasty changes or uh, modifications to Section 230, as was proposed last year uh, by the NTIA, would have 
dramatically changed content moderation practices. And those the effects of those practices, be they over moderation or under moderation, um, would be more pronounced for communities that are over policed in person anyways. Um, the, a lot of those biases can translate over into online spaces too. And the, I think that the last thing is that uh, MMTC's perspective really shared what uh, a lot of what uh, a lot of what um, Julie talked about, which was that the, the important the importance for just the small like the smaller platforms and for the small business communities. Um, I'm not going to repeat any of those points, but um, the 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 waves of litigation and disputes that could arise from major changes, um, you know, the, it just wouldn't have, you know, the, it just wouldn't have worked. Um, you know, not everyone has the resource to withstand that kind of thing. Um, and that's where we were coming from. Now, Julie, I'd, I, I led in to this discussion with a, the quote from Dickens, really about the, the two, two contrasting views and visions of where we are and it, it applies to Section 230 and, and to all the companies and, and to the voices that, that you're speaking for right now. Yeah. Many of the larger ones who are in, in, the, in the public eye or the public debate before Congress, um, you know, at one level, they give us tremendous connectivity, social relationships, connectivity, enormous positive contributions, both to the economic innovation and the well-being uh, that that all of us in America, you know, do celebrate. But then at the same time, you you do have the divisions, the deep divisions, and what we've seen in in one of the worst years in American history. While at the same time, greater voter participation, uh, greater connectivity. Um, so it is that right now we have the, these dual conflicting forces in our country. And so if we were to talk about reform uh, in, as it relates to Section 230, and how do we inspire greater trust and, and greater transparency and greater security and a greater understanding of what Section 230 means in our, in our laws and the way we now do everything from education to healthcare to commerce to social relationships and connectivity. So speak a little bit, uh, Julie, if we were to look at reform, any ideas? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, you know, Chip, everything you just laid out there, you laid it out so eloquently, it's difficult to follow. I think that, that you know, what, what we need to think about as we think about potentially reforming such a kind of core law to how the internet works, is the impact it would have. Like, you know, Devon and I kind of came back to the same thing. I'm gonna come back to it again. The impact it would have on the smaller players. Um, you know, again, the debate focuses on a few large names, even Brad and with all due respect, Pinterest is a big company. You know, you guys are not, you guys are pretty big at this point. And the truth is that if, if we do see drastic reform or even frankly, moderate reform to section 230, larger platforms, larger companies will be able to comply. It might change the way we interact with them, but they have the resources to comply. Who doesn't have the resources to comply are smaller startups, nonprofit organizations, marginalized voices, you know, exactly who, do, who needs the protection. Now, this is not to say that there's no way to reform the law. This is not to say there are no changes that can be made. But it is to say that we really need to think through that kind of through that lens. My biggest concern is that Congress will come in with a sledgehammer, uh, or NTIA for that matter, will come in with a sledgehammer when what they really need is a scalpel, if anything. Um, and, and, and who will end up paying the price? will not be these large companies that are the focus of the debate, but again, the smaller ones and, and the ones who aren't even like the, the companies that, that don't even exist yet, the platforms that don't even exist yet. So that, you know, that I think about that all the time, you know, what, what we're in theory doing is creating potential barriers to entry that are incredibly difficult to surmount. And one of the things, you know, I'd like to bring up today, 
that, that I was looking at earlier, the, the new uh, Senate bill that was uh, just came out, we're recording this um, February 5th on Friday. Um, and the new bill, the new proposal from Senator Warner and Klobuchar and a few others, one of the things it would do would be to change Section 230 to an affirmative defense. And, you know, without getting in the weeds, um, though I guess we're in the weeds, this is a policy summit. <laughs> you know, like, I've spent a lot of time in my career working with small companies on how to navigate uh, regulatory structures. And when you create a framework, that basically says in order to receive the protections of the law, you need to spend six figures plus to litigate, which is essentially what that proposal would do, then you are closing the doors. You are closing the doors for small companies. You are closing the doors for smaller platforms. You're closing the doors for you know, everyone except for a handful of really big players. And we really, really need to be mindful of, of threading that needle correctly. Yeah, Julie, you know, Encompass, you know, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the 96 Act. This year, Encompass turns 40 years old. And so at our happy birthday. Happy birthday uh, to us. But we are the founding association for competition. So we, we started in advocating to break up AT&T and bring competition to telecommunications. And now we continue to be the advocate for the same forces of competition and new entrant and, and, and new competition, new technologies. And so people don't realize Section 230 is so critical uh, to our, con our, our competition. We like to refer to it as, as the constitution of, of competition, uh, the 96 Act and, and the principles that are enduring. And so we really do wanna make sure that, that as we look at ideas addressing 230 going forward, that we don't in it unintentionally really cripple competition and harm competition. And, and I'd, I'd like to ask um, Brad and Devon, do y'all have anything that y'all would like to add to Julie's comments before we go to the next question? So I, I think that, you know, it's, it's something that, um, you know, we think about in terms of you know, how is it that the law would affect companies of, of all sizes? And, um, you know, I, so I think that it's important for, for any reform to, to think, you know, to consider that um, Section 230 applies to everyone. Yeah. You know, can I add one other thing? Sorry, I'm not yes. done. No, I'm feeling a little fired up now. <laughs> I'm feeling a little rowdy. Um, you know, I, I don't mean to sound kind of corny, um, but you also can't have this conversation outside of the context that this is the United States where we have strong First Amendment protections and we have a real culture of protecting freedom of speech. And sometimes that's really hard and sometimes it's really messy. And this is not the first time in American history where we have found ourselves in a moment where freedom of speech feels dangerous to many, but that doesn't mean you know, that doesn't mean that as Americans, we shouldn't really think long and hard about how we think of freedom of speech rights, about how we protect the rights to speech. There is a cost to protecting the rights of speech. It is beyond an economic cost, it's beyond a business cost, but it's, it's you know, a fundamental cost. And that's something that's, I don't know, I, I think a lot about this, like, I, I think it's really incredibly important that we protect that part of our culture. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not simple. It's messy. It is really messy. Um, but that doesn't mean we should just throw up our hands and give up on it either. And, and I think that this is a, a good lead into our next question. There, and I think before we can solve any problem, we have to understand, you know, and agree upon what are the facts of the underlying issue. So I'd like to ask each of, of, of the panelists, what do you think is the biggest misconception or the most inaccurate perception of what Section 230 is and what it does? And at, Devon, I'm gonna start with you and then I'll go to, to, to Brad and, and, and then to Julie. Um, I, I think the biggest misconception would be that we've already kind of talked about it, it's that it only applies to these giant internet companies. Um, whereas the reality is that it applies 
broadly. So, you know, I, I will echo that um, you when you I think that I there's this common perception that only the, the largest tech companies and, you know, the, the, the handful of companies that are just constantly mentioned over and over again, that, that they somehow uniquely benefit from Section 230. Um, you know, I think a related misconception is many people believe that there are ways to reform Section 230 that would only apply to these largest tech companies. And, um, you know, as, as I mentioned just previously, changes to Section 230 would apply to all platforms, small, medium, and large. Um, you know, from an impact perspective, the medium and smaller sized companies would be disproportionately harmed if Congress were to repeal or weaken 230. Um, you know, we heard uh, Devon mentioned uh, threats of litigation and lawsuits, um, and, and there are other, obviously, uh, impacts there too. So, um, you know, I think that it's important to keep that in mind. Perhaps not surprisingly, I totally agree with what both of them said. Um, but on top of that, I'd say there's a real misconception around uh, how 230 actually works. Uh, and Brian, you talked about this in your introduction when you're talking about Pinterest, but under 230, Pinterest also has the right to moderate and to police content on its site. Section 230 doesn't it explicitly gives that right to platforms. And that's a really important piece uh, of the law, and it's one that gets completely confused in the discourse around it. Um, and I think that, frankly, you know, this is on a lot of us who live in the space. I think we haven't done it, it's a it's a complicated. I mean, like many legislative regimes, it's complicated. But um, I think it's pretty clear that like the general zeitgeist of people who follow politics um, and aren't deep in the tech issues probably don't understand how the law works. And I, I just say on top of that, really quickly. Um, you know, the fact that that so many people on far ends of the spectrum are pissed about 230, I think maybe shows that we're doing something kind of right. I don't know, you know, <laughs> because the people who are the most angry are angry for totally different reasons. Um, I would just point out that that's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. And yeah. Chip, Chip, if I could just, um, oh. Don't yeah, no, be great. No, no, be great, Lindsay. Yeah, I just wanted to hone in on a few points because I totally agree with what's been said. And I think an important part of Section 230 is that it actually, well, reason why it was passed was to promote competition and investment in the market. And we're seeing that happen. So, I mean, just, just to hash it out a little, I mean, Section 230 works as a shield and as a sword, right? So it allows platforms to host um, third party content without being treated as the speaker or publisher. Um, and it, and like Julie said, it, it allows platforms to moderate content in good faith. And this ability to host and moderate content is good for competition because it allows these websites to differentiate themselves um, by what they allow on their websites. So, with the 230 protections, an online provider can offer content um, that, their, that their, their users want to see, um, but they also can remove content that they don't want to see. So to Julie's point, um, I, I do actually think it really promotes competition. And, and I think that the, um, the moderation piece often gets overlooked. Um, and, and I think that 230 is a really complex issue and it leads to a lot of myths and disinformation. And so this may be really nerdy, but I really encourage people to actually read the statute in 47 U.S. Code um, 230 because it's really you know it's it's a lot easier to understand what 230 does and what it doesn't if you actually read the language of the statute and I think um, simply doing that could actually curb a lot of confusion that's out there. But, you know, one of the the biggest misconceptions from my perspective, and I'd like the the, the panel whoever would like to respond. This is just not it doesn't 230 doesn't pr protect just the large tech companies. But if, if you're a small business owner, if you're in the restaurant industry, if you're in the hospitality industry, if you're um, in any industry like realtors who post uh, and allow third party content to be posted on their websites, does Section 230 also apply and protect them from, from any type of litigation to the post and the comments 
and the rankings and the ratings and the things that are just a natural part of every business and every life in America. The Section 230 also protect every small business in every sector. I can go ahead and, and weigh in first, but absolutely. I mean, I think that is like the core message that this panel probably should, should let, leave viewers with is that what you said is exactly right. And again, it's not just that, that it protects those core businesses. You know, a lot of those businesses, the, the, a realtor would still be able to sell houses, for instance, without a web presence. But that is not how we operate. Yeah you know, in, in 20, 2021, that that's the first tours of a home. Now, the majority right. are virtual, especially during COVID, you know, even more in this moment when everything we do is virtual, right. um, you know, th there has to be some kind of recognition of the role. I think that the internet and internet based technologies play in everyday life and everyday communications and everyday commerce, et cetera, you name, you name the thing. Um, and again, you know, this is where I started and it's where I'll always start and where I'll always end on 230. We need to make a decision as a society how interactive we want that to be. I believe personally and professionally that the internet is this amazing tool for interactivity, for being able to speak, you know, across all kinds of different barriers, borders, et cetera, you name it. Um, maybe that's like a little pie in the sky, but I think it's meaningful. And if we, we get this wrong, we're gonna turn ourselves into essentially just like fancier televi broadcast television. It is, so we would go back in time. Devon, with, with that, and kind of talking about this tension. So many on the right look at content moderation and the practices of, of a lot of companies as censorship. And then many on the left view that those companies are not doing enough to, to moderate out hateful and harmful speech. How do you reconcile those tensions and any thoughts that you might have? Um, I, I think with conversations kind of like this, where you get stakeholders from different areas and different you know, subject matter expertises to weigh in on the actual reforms, if there were any, because that seems to, you know, that's kind of seems to be like one of the cool foundations of the internet, like from a personal perspective, is that it's kind of like the, a lot of room for like collaborative for moving growth. Um, now, there are specific legal recommendations. I'm not going to speak to them because I don't know them. I have, you know, I'm not going to be able to speak to like the details. Um, there are a lot of different recommendations that MMTC has seen focus on kind of parsing out the moderation of content as speech versus parsing out like discriminatory practices. Now, though the difference between the two as it applies legally and as it would be implemented, I'm not, again, I'm just not going to speak to because, you know, I don't have the specific language. And when you're dealing with something like Section 230, uh, even minor changes are consequential. Um, however, I, I think I would maintain that the, you know, how do you reconcile, you know, tensions between you know, censorship and, uh, you know, not uh, hate speech and, you know, all these different kind of forces that are coming. Uh, I, I think it's something like this through consensus and through principle, um, through application of principle and kind of building consensus around those principles. Um, you know, I, I, something that I've, uh, and actually I think I'll leave it there. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to, everyone else on this panel has like actual, like, uh, like work experience on this. So I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to detract from it, um, but I think I would leave it. I would leave it there. Anybody uh, want to uh, comment on that on the question, just of the tensions on the right and the left, and any thoughts of how to bridge uh, those differences with two thirty? Well, like I said earlier, they might be a sign that uh, <laughs> two thirty might be working just fine. <laughs> um, but but one other thing I come to Vaughn got me thinking that. It, in the category of things that are misunderstood about 230 that we haven't explicitly said is 230 does not protect the speaker from legal action. We're, I mean, I, I think people, mostly people know this, but I think we also fail to say this. It doesn't somehow, uh, if you, in posting something on the internet, 
break some law or use speech that is not protected by the First Amendment. The speaker is not. There's no shield for the speaker in that instance. I think that's an important so if point. If you defame they, someone or commit fraud, right. or crime, or that's you can go after the speaker. Libel. So yeah. The the complaint, you know, from those who um, I guess would are who are not the biggest fans of 230 is that it's really hard and expensive. You know, that that would be the kind of counterpoint to that. But I just wanted to kind of put that out there quickly. I think that. You know, the, the right and the left see the problem very differently. And I think, um, you know, after this, this election, you know, this past November and uh, this past January and everything that's happened since we've kind of seen, there has never been a better teaching moment actually for Do 30. Like we have seen this law in action in the most public way possible. We saw platforms, uh, take all kinds of different actions with regard to then President Trump's uh, accounts. You know, they pulled down different things at different times and they kind of, you know, what that looked like was different. And it kind of gave people an opportunity to see that kind of competition at play. Um, as far as the disagreements on either side, I think it's going to, it makes it definitely makes it harder for. Uh, the opponents of 230 to find common ground because the, the, you know, the arguments are just really, really different. You know, on the right, like you said, they claim that that conservative voices are silenced, uh, even though I point out data show that um, conservative voices are actually amplified on the most popular social networks all the time, which is a really interesting dynamic. Um, we could talk about that on many panels. I don't know if we need to, to get into it today. Um, but anyway, you know, finding that common ground is going to be incredibly hard, which also gets to, I think, what's going to happen to 230. And, and it makes it really hard to game it out because it's really hard to imagine uh, common ground between the two sides, unless the Democrats just absolutely push something through, which I think is highly unlikely because there are certain senators, like in particular, Senator Wyden, who is who's, who was one of the authors of 230 and who is a strong defender of 230 to this day. That as, as we talk about you know, just the importance of 230, the controversy around 230, it goes into a broader social, cultural, civil society deficit right now. And that is trust. So how do we, you know, the, the, the lack of trust in our governing institutions and in traditional media and new media and in, in parts of social media is transparency possibly the answer? And how, how do we increase the transparency of how all of our companies and member companies and new companies uh, have their policies and practices? Uh, how, do, how, how do they become more transparent? And then even things like algorithms and things, how do we, how do we educate the American public in a way that we increase trust and maybe that is one of the, the most effective ways that we could, we could protect sections 230 helpful um, and good benefits to the country. So what, uh, uh, Brad, any thoughts on transparency? Uh, and then Lindsay and, and Julie and, and Devon. Yeah, so, you know, transparency is certainly one way that you can earn trust with your users or your customer base. Um, and you know, for Pinterest, we really value being upfront and clear about our policies. We want users to know what to expect when they come to our site. So we've created what we call community guidelines. And um, you know, these, these community guidelines are basically kind of the rules of the road. It's what you can do with content, content on our site. You know, what content we don't allow. Um, we've made them very easy to find on our site. Uh, they're written in simple language, not legalese that everyone can understand. Um, and we make it very easy to report content that shouldn't be on our site. Um, and you know, these community guidelines, they prohibit the kinds of content that people don't find inspiring. Um, it's harmful, hateful, violent, false or misleading, you know, explicit, antagonistic, um, 
those aren't the kind of, that's not the content we want on Pinterest. Um, and, you know, so we want people to be inspired and we want them to know that they can be inspired when they come on Pinterest. Any, uh, anyone else, Julie, on transparency? Yeah, I, and transparency and trust. I think it's so important to talk about both in this context. Listen, I think the internet, if you take a step back and think about the internet, it only works because we trust that it works because we trust that when you like press send on an email, it's going to end up in the recipient's box or when you Google something, you're gonna actually get search results or even more when you enter your credit card information, it's going to be safe. Like that is the most basic level of trust. And so we talk about how there's so much mistrust on the internet. I think you're absolutely right. But if you actually like take a step back and think about it, there's actually a ton of trust that the internet is going to work. The internet is premised on trust. Most of us, myself included, don't actually understand how the ones and zeros make that happen. I just click send. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really important dynamic here. I do think that transparency is a huge piece of the puzzle. I'm watching the Facebook Oversight Board very closely, which um, you know is, is this independent body, international body that kind of is, is investigating decisions Facebook makes around takedowns. In this instance, it's of former President Trump's Facebook account, um, and that will that process has transparency to it. I'm. Uh, I'm really interested in how that will play out. I think it will uh, perhaps serve as a model for other companies as well. Um, and again, you know, whether it be 230 or a lot of other issues that that a lot of these platforms in particular face, uh, whether it be privacy legislation, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of companies are looking for some regulatory framework, not necessarily in this particular instance, but um, these are hard decisions, and I think a lot of companies would like to see some certainty, some rules of the road from government to know how to comply. Um, and I think that's an interesting way to think about this as well. And Lindsay, wanna, uh, we have about five minutes or so left. Talk a little bit about what's to come. And then I'd like to ask each of the panel panelists to close by if we're trying to achieve as we've gone from pandemic and protest and political crisis in the context of the role of 230 and how we communicate, um, how do we get to a consensus around uh, section 230, which is so core to how the internet works so that we, we protect it if we need to repair it in any way, repair the trust in any way, but, but really preserve it and all the good that is brought. So uh, Lindsay, uh, why don't you start us? What's to come? And then everybody else on the panel, how do we get from today, cool off and then get to consensus? Sure, so I'll kind of talk to um, what I think is likely to happen, even though of course, who knows? <laughs> so, I mean, at the FCC, I don't think FCC action is likely anymore um, because as I said, on um, the last um, FCC under Chairman Pai, they didn't act on NTIA's petition and acting Chairwoman Rosenwurzel and Commissioner Starks, who are now the two Democrat commissioners at the FCC were not supportive of FCC action um, to, um, in response to NTIA's petition last summer. So that petition at the FCC, I think will just sit um, or will be denied at the commission. Um, from at Congress, I don't see this issue going away anytime soon. Um, there's a lot of momentum, momentum as um, we've discussed here in Congress to do something on both, both sides of the aisle. Um, so I think what to do, if anything, will be really tough to answer, but I envision many more bills being introduced and reintroduced this session and also more congressional hearings on the topic. Um, and at the executive branch, I think NTIA um, could move forward with convening stakeholders on this topic. Um, and to your question kind of of getting to consensus, it relates to this because I, I actually do think that would be um, a great thing to do to get all the stakeholders and convene people together, even in panels like this, but also more formally because they're just 
as we've seen, there are so many perspectives um, on this issue and so many ripple effects. Um, so I think we really need to think about that when we're discussing Section 230, bringing all the voices to the table. And I guess just one minor point, I think moving forward, we need to, I think we and policymakers really need to start asking the question of what's the problem they're trying to solve and is Section 230 the best answer for it? And it might be, but I think oftentimes we're looking at different problems and, and different solutions, which makes the whole conversation a little bit more confusing. <laughs> Devon, we'll start with you then on this tough uh, last question on how do we move to consensus and then Brad and then Julie, we're going to let you uh, back clean up. Just conversations like this. Yeah, I, I think it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, that, that's, I really don't have much more to add because like the, 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 I guess the most important concept from MMTC's perspective would just be the the fact that the conversations are happening and that they're inclusive of voices that are traditionally left out is the important piece of uh, the puzzle. Um, so as the, you know, as these conversations occur in legal circles in policy circles in tech circles in whatever, uh, you know, circles they're happening in, because there are a lot of different conversations and a lot of different kinds of stakeholders. Um, you know, I think that just the continued you know, the, just the continued d desire to build consensus is what I'd say would be the most important thing. Um, and then I guess to the last question, uh, transparency was a principle that was brought up. And I think that that'll be another important thing as this process moves forward, um, like just principle-based thinking and kind of allowing that to guide the rest of the conversations as they move ahead. Um, yeah. Brad. So I'll echo a little bit then um, what everyone else is saying too. It, certainly we need to get people together and, and have these discussions, right? Um, and they can't be one-sided, uh, they should be comprehensive and um, you need all the stakeholders in the room. And, and that includes the smaller and medium-sized companies um, out there. Um, you know, I, I think anything that can be brought forth that might, uh, you know, discuss how Section 230 is not just a shield that big tech can hide behind, um, you know, something that can really talk about how the rest of tech benefits from the flexibility to experiment, um, new policies, new practices for enforcement. You know, we're all working hard to try to keep our platforms positive and welcoming. Um, and, you know, with, with that ability to experiment, um, comes innovation. And we want to be more proactive on combating misinformation and harmful content. Um, we're all going to benefit from that. And Julia, you get to close. I get to close. Listen, I think that this fits into obviously a much larger political moment that the tech sector is facing, like a so-called tech lash, if you will. And I think there are a couple things I would say about that more broadly. Obviously, I completely agree that we need to have real robust conversations about what these proposals would actually do to real people um, and real smaller companies. But, but I, would, I would take a step back to, and I, I think that the conversation that we're having around tech right now is so knee jerk and it feels so politically charged and dangerous to me. And I think uh, for a long time, obviously it was like tech could do no wrong. Um, and, and everything that these companies said was perfect and they were building these things and it was perfect. And now the pendulum has swung the other way. And while a correction is fine, um, I think it has swung so far the other way that we have completely divorced ourselves from, from talking about some of the benefits of technology in, in kind of popular discourse. And I think it's really dangerous when we have these political debates. And I hope that as part of it, we are able to have a more measured conversation to talk about benefits um, and to talk about things that aren't beneficial as well. Uh, I think that's, and that's on a lot of us to kind of push that. You know, I think one of the problems to dig in a little bit more specifically is that for a long time, we talked about technology as a silver bullet. We could fix all the world's problems. And I think that was, that's wrong, you know, and I think we need to talk about technology as a layer, as a layer that helps connect people, but there's still people below the, the connection level. And if we can talk about that um, with a little bit more nuance, yeah. then I think we will get ourselves to a better end result in many of these debates, 
first and foremost, this one around Section 230. Well, uh, speaking now from Encompass, we want to do everything we can to help bring all the stakeholders together and to be a constructive voice in this conversation. Uh, when I was in the House of Representatives, I used to speak of many of my colleagues and say they had the political touch of a blacksmith. And, and at this point, we need more of a, a light touch and a soft touch and, a, and, a, and one that is principle, principle driven of transparency and trust. And, and how do we best accomplish that while preserving one of the great American success, success stories of all time? I really thank each of our panelists. This has been a great conversation. I hope it is enlightening as we move forward through the rest of the year, this Congress and before the commission and a new administration. And I look forward to working with each of you to get to a good place, hopefully that we can all be proud of. <laughs>